Oh, yeah, I, I know what you might be thinking. Why the hell did South Florida hire Charlie Strong, who absolutely struggled in his three years at Texas, posting a losing season every year he was there? And that's a fair question. I think South Florida looked at Charlie Strong from various angles, and most of them came out on the positive end. Number one, he's been a coach in some way, shape, or form for the last 34 years, since 1983. Almost half that time he coached in the state of Florida, including D coordinator for the 2008 national champion Florida Gators. Another thing, too, about Charlie Strong, he has proven that he can win as a head coach. We saw that at Louisville his last two years there, combined record of 23-3. and But getting back to Florida, I think another reason why USF hired him is because of not only his connections with the state, but also to recruiting. They know that he has a lot of angles when it comes to recruiting in that state. So from those perspectives, I think overall the move makes sense that USF would sweep Charlie Strong make him their head coach as Willie Taggart, who led USF to a lot of success last season in their best year ever, was hired by the Oregon Ducks. Before we go further, though, speaking of last year, did you know that South Florida's double-digit winning season in 2016 was the first one ever in their school history? Even though I know they've only been playing college ball for 20 years, last year, in fact, they won 11 games, including a share of the American Athletic Conference East Division Championship and winning the Birmingham Bowl over South Carolina. 11-2 record, not too shabby, and most of their starters are back. We're going to begin on offense where it's a new offensive coordinator as well, not just a new head coach, Sterling Gilbert. Okay, The offensive coordinator will be bringing a beer shoot offense into the mix for USF. Now, Quentin Flowers, if you've seen this guy play, he's outstanding, and he reminds you so much of last year's Heisman Trophy winner, Lamar Jackson. He runs tremendously. He's got a good arm, and by the way, um, he completed 63% of his passes did flowers. That's higher than what Lamar Jackson did. And both quarterbacks, by the way, rushed for over 1,500 yards. Now, will this new offense change a lot of what um, USF was doing from the uh, spread attack? I think in some ways, yes, because in the spread attack, you saw a lot of um, flowers running with the ball. Not saying that he won't run this time. I think you gotta have him run because he's your, your he's your best rusher. But you will see Flowers uh, throw more often, especially the vertical passing attack. You'll see more pocket passing from uh, Quentin Flowers. So expect that. Now, who will be the number one target for Flowers to throw to? Pretty good question because the most recent one, Rodney Adams, are all everything wide out. Has finally moved on. I think this is a big loss because he was such a game breaker. So Marquise Valdez-Scantling, maybe he's the number one guy, had 22 receptions last year, but expect that number to go up big time in 2016. Tyree McCants figures to be an integral part of the offense. And looking at the ground attack, still talking about receivers because the Ernest Johnson actually is the leading returning receiver for the Bulls. 28 receptions, even though he's listed as a running back on the ground, by the way, had 543 yards and had a total of 14 touchdowns, so some production there. But they will miss Marion Mack, who's the school's all-time leading rusher. His loss will hurt, to a degree, the South Florida offense. Most of the offensive linemen do return, um, all seniors, by the way, in Cameron Ruff at center, as well as the left guard in Jeremy Hall and right tackle in Marcus Norman. But they do have to replace the left tackle as well as the right guard. South Florida last year was so fantastic offensively, 11th in the country in total offense, averaging close to 490 per game. And just like his old school, Texas, last season, USF, offensively productive, defensively lacking a lot to be desired, especially when it came to just simple fundamentals like tackling, and USF was horrible at it. 120th in the country in total D last year was South Florida, giving up a whopping 482 yards on average per game. So, obviously changes have to occur, and it's the fourth defensive coordinator as many seasons now for the Bulls. Brian Jean-Marie, former linebackers coach for UT, now comes back to the state of Florida, and of course comes along with Charlie Strong to try to revamp that deed. Now, as far as looks, you know, this team's used to running a 4-2-5 alignment. Expect multiple looks, including what Charlie Strong 
uh, really likes the most the 335. But again, multiple looks will be used by South Florida. Hey, any change you make is positive when you're as bad in one area as South Florida was on defense a year ago. You got plenty of experience back, but as far as production, we'll wait and see. Defensive end, uh, Mike Love does return, and your defensive tackles, also seniors, are back in Bruce Hector as well as uh, Detrin uh, Sinnott. So a lot of upperclassmen on that defensive line, but have they gotten better? Well, one guy that didn't have to worry about getting better because he's always been good, and that is Augie Sanchez. His career has been very productive, high tackles a year ago, and for his career, over 300. So you don't have to worry about him. Secondary, a lot of eyes will be on these guys because of how bad they were, but we'll see if another year of experience and a new coordinator can get the job done. You've got Ronnie um, Hoggins on one side of the corner, and on the other side, uh, Dietrich Nichols, who's made 27 career starts for the Bulls. One thing that will help is the strong safety that's Devin Abraham, who only got to play a fraction of the 2016 season, played just five games before a broken finger derailed the rest of his year. But he's back and ready to go. Um, your kicker and your punter are both seniors. The punter, Jonathan Hernandez, averaged close to 42 yards per boot. And the place kicker, well, you know, South Florida scored so many touchdowns last year that they really didn't give their place kicker much shot at field goals. That's a good thing, right? Well, when he was called upon, Emilio uh, Nagelman was effective, a perfect 7-7, but did miss late in 2016 because of an injury, so he didn't play the last few games of last year's campaign. Now let's chit-chat about the schedule. And when you look at the schedule, the non-conference part of it at least, you might be thinking a comedian's opening act, or you might be thinking the Sunday cartoons, or how about one other thing too? How about a joke book? Because this non-conference schedule is humorous. Now no schedules are made far in advance, but are you kidding me? You open up the year late August, at San Jose State. The opener at home is Stony Brook. Stony Brook? Stony Brook? Oh, let's just move on. The uh, conference opener is at Connecticut. They suck. And your only uh, game against a Power 5 conference team is against Illinois, one of the worst teams in the Big Ten. First year head coach uh, Levy Smith. That should be a win for USF. And if you're looking at the biggest games of the year, September 21st, Temple. The Owls were the only team to beat South Florida in conference play a year ago. And it was an important game because it kept South Florida from representing the East in the uh, conference championship game. Temple got to go instead of USF. So we'll see if it's revenge for the Bulls. Later in the year, you'll see Central Florida, the war on I-4. Big rivalry game between the Knights and the Bulls. This time it'll be played in Orlando. And that'll be November 24th on a Friday night in front of a national audience. That could be the game right there to see if South Florida can go a perfect 12-0. Keep in mind that in the West Division, the top two teams expected this year are Memphis as well as Navy. And USF doesn't play either one of them. The third and fourth best teams, Houston and Tulsa, both come to Tampa to play the Bulls. You talk about a very favorable schedule. They can't go 12-0 because they're going to be favored in every game. But they can't go 12-0 this year. They never will be able to. So Charlie Strong, golden opportunity to run the table. Finally, let's chit-chat about the projected win total, according to Vegas, for the South Florida Bulls. Right now, it stands at 10 regular season wins. Do I think that's too high, too low, or just about right? I actually think South Florida is going to exceed the 10-win regular season total, um, most likely 11-1. I do think there'll be a loss somewhere along the way. The defense is going to take them time to get to play on a level that's respectable. Right now, it is well below average. I think it's going to take longer than one year for that defense to rise and play decent. Offensively, they'll still score enough points to win. And I do think this time that one conference loss does not uh, keep them at home. I think they will play in the AAC championship game, either against a Memphis or a Navy. And I think the Bulls this time win it. And I think USF will represent the group of five conference champions and get a major bowl bid. But keep in mind that even if South Florida wins every single game, wins the conference championship and goes a perfect 13-0, I still don't think they're going to get considered for a college football playoff. I just don't think when you play San Jose State, Illinois, as well as Stony Brook and UMass, probably the worst team in college football, that that's going to hold much of a candle when it comes to that playoff committee deciding the four teams. I think a major bowl bid is likely for USF, but a playoff bid, no way.
That's my look at the Bulls. See you next time.